Today we'll be talking about Xerox PARC, a place that is responsible for some of the technology industry's greatest innovations and played a huge role in the creation of some of the world's biggest tech companies. In short, this is a story of how Xerox PARC created trillions of dollars worth of innovations and gave it all away. The year is 1969. Jack Goldman, Xerox chief scientist at the time, decides to start a new division in the Xerox company. At the time, Xerox had a very profitable printing business, so they wanted to spend more money on research and development of new technologies. They hoped that this would make them more money after their patents on printers had expired. Thus, the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, or Xerox Park for short, was created. It was aimed at research and innovations in the fields of computer software and hardware, and they ended up creating some of the most revolutionary technologies in the tech industry. Before computers had the interactive graphical user interfaces we know today, you had to manually type in commands into a command line program. This was very unintuitive and quite difficult for the average person to use. That's when Xerox Park developed the first iteration of a graphical user interface, which replaced the command line with an on-screen icon and menu. Here's a video of Steve Jobs speaking about what he saw at Park. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I had ever seen in my life. After Steve Jobs saw it, he ended up bringing all his engineers from Apple to Park so they could learn the system and incorporate it into the Apple computers. This led to Apple having its own graphical user interface in the Lisa computer, which led to its popularity and Apple today has a market cap of over $2 trillion at the time of recording. The graphical user interface was eventually incorporated into the Windows operating system, ensuring that almost every consumer computer created had a graphical user interface, which led to this mass adoption of computers, since they were now easier and useful to the end consumer. As we've already mentioned, Microsoft benefited a lot from the Xerox Park graphical user interface innovation, but there's more to the story. Charles Simone was a very talented engineer at Xerox Park. He was integral to the development of the Bravo program, which is a very basic form of what would later become Microsoft Word. While at Xerox, he was approached by Bill Gates, who later hired him. He was hired to build out the first version of the Microsoft Suite, drawing from his work at Park on the Bravo project. It was a smashing success, and until this day, Microsoft Office Suite still remains Microsoft's flagship product. According to their 2019 financial year, it made up almost 20% of the company's revenue. Microsoft at the time of recording has a market cap of $1.9 trillion. Charles Gashke and John Warnock were talented engineers at Park who were unable to convince Xerox management of the approach to commercialize the Interpress graphics language for controlling printing. They subsequently left Xerox to start Adobe in 1982. At their new company, they developed an equivalent technology called PostScript from scratch and bought it to market for Apple's laser printers in 1985. Adobe later went on to become the behemoth we know it to be today with a market cap of just over $200 billion. I'm sure you're starting to notice a theme. Many of the very talented engineers at Park, who were the brightest in their fields and had been recruited from Stanford, MIT, and other top tech firms at the time, began to leave Xerox and seek employment elsewhere. One of the most high profile of these engineers was Larry Tesla, who worked on human computer interaction at Park. Among other projects, he worked on a program called Gypsy which was the first word processor to have a graphical user interface. After leaving Park, he worked at Apple on the Lisa and Newton project. In 2001, he then joined Amazon as Vice President of Shopping Experience, where he was responsible for the book preview program and other aspects of the Amazon website's interface. He returned to the Bay Area in 2005 to join Yahoo as the Vice President of User Experience and Design and now works as a consultant on user interface design having helped many startups in the Bay Area succeed. There are plenty more examples of talent from Xerox Park joining other big tech companies and helping them grow. It's important to note that Park was not Xerox's first research center. They had already established one in Rochester, New York, 
where the headquarters were located, which focused on refining and expanding the company's copier business. Zerg's Park was a site for pioneering work in advanced physics, material science and computer science applications. And that was the problem. The distance between the East Coast and the West Coast made it hard for communication between the Park team and the managers in New York. Also, the managers in the East Coast were only interested in ideas that would help Xerox sell more printers and no new innovations, hence the state of the overly expensive costs associated with owning a printer today. In summary, Xerox Park was partly responsible for more than $4.1 trillion worth of market cap innovation in just Apple, Microsoft and Adobe and were directly responsible for trillions more of innovation employees who left to join companies like Amazon, Yahoo and Apple. But today their market cap is just $4.7 billion, a far cry from what it could have been. I think this quote by Ted Nelson summarizes Xerox well. In order to sell printers, they throw away the universe.